All right. Uh, good morning, afternoon, whatever time it is where you are. Um, what I'm going to do now is go through the final lecture um, to cover the chapter four. I'm wearing my Elon shirt today, so yay. Um, so uh, what we're going to talk about in this lecture is um, gene interactions. Now, this is probably the most complicated part of this um, chapter, so listen up. Um, the important thing to know before we start talking about this is that this lecture, uh, or the gene interaction section, is now referring to two genes. So the other parts of this chapter are referring to interesting genetic phenomena that occur with um, just one gene. Now we're looking at the interaction between two separate genes. Um, this is really important because, oops, this is really important to understand or to think about because um, basically gene interactions occur when two or more genes influence the outcome of a single trait. Tea. Thank you. More tea in the same mug. So, um, DNA mug for a genetics lecture. Look at this mug. It's got DNA on one side and then it's got on the other side pointing to DNA that says there's your problem think about that for a minute a little view of my into my psyche okay so what we're talking about here is interaction between multiple genes really two genes in this case um, this is important to understand because really there are very few single dream gene traits Mendel was actually pretty lucky um, in the fact that most of the stuff that he studied were basically single gene traits. Otherwise, it would have been a lot more confusing. But very little genetics actually works that way in the real world. It's way more complicated than that. In fact, when you think about things like intelligence or um, height, uh, things like this, all these traits that we think are, you know, partly genetic, right? Because they run in families. Um, these are actually the combinatorial effect of many genes plus environmental factors that give you the phenotypes that you see. So understanding that multiple genes are often involved in traits is important. And what we're gonna look at in this lecture is actually two genes and how they interact. So types of Mendelian inheritance patterns that involve two genes as shown here, these terms on the left have stasis, complementation, gene modifier effect, gene redundancy. These are all genetic terms that describe different Mendelian inheritance patterns when two genes influence each other. And we're going to go through a few examples of these in the next few slides. So this phenomenon um, was first observed by these two people, Bateson and Punnett. Punnett, of course, of Square fame. Uh, and they looked at crosses between sweet peas, kind of following in Mendel's footsteps. Normally, these plants have purple flowers. So it was known that there were mutants of these plants that had white flowers. And what Bateson and Punnett did was take two true breeding varieties of white flowers. So, again, the true breeding, right? They have to be homozygous where you get a true breeding plant. Um, and they cross them together. And to their surprise, the parents are both white. You cross them together, and the F1 generation was all purple. And they took that generation and self-crossed it. Right? Um, and then they saw this really weird ratio in the F2 generation that's shown at the bottom here. Nine purple flowers to seven white flowers. Now, one thing I'd like to point out here is look at that ratio for a second and add it up. It's a ratio of 16, right? Kind of like 9331, the classic Mendelian dihybrid cross ratio. The fact that this is a ratio of 16, just like in the case of 9331, this tells you that two genes are involved, and you're looking at some kind of dihybrid cross. So two heterozygotes cross to each other, um, which makes sense because they were true breeding in the first place, right? Um, the fact that this is not 
classic Mendelian ratio of 9331 means that one of those genes is influencing the phenotypes of the other gene in some way. So epistasis, which is the idea that one gene can influence the function of another, um, alters classic Mendelian ratios. But please notice that it is still a ratio of 60. If you go back to your original dihybrid cross, your Punnett square of 16 squares, your 9331 phenotypic ratio, what you see when you look at that dihybrid cross is that the nine things that all look the same all look like this. They have at least one, they have one dominant allele of each of the two genes. Now notice that here I've changed the way I write this a little bit. So nine are Big A, something else, big B, something else. A, this dash can be either, it means it's either uh, two dominant alleles or a dominant and recessive allele, because these look the same, right? They have at least one dominant allele. And same with the Bs, right? If you put this little blank here, it just means that it could be a big B or a little B, because both of these things look the same. So if you go back to that 16 square square, you'll see that the nine that all look the same have at least one dominant allele of each gene. The three that look the same are the homozygote recessive for B and at least one dominant A. The three that also look distinct are homozygous recessive, A, at least one dominant B, and of course, the red-headed stepchild of the Punnett square right here, this uh, one that's always in the corner is, of course, the homozygote double recessive. So, right here, they saw a ratio of 16, just like here, right? 16 different um, squares, but the ratio is different, 9 to 7 instead of 9, 3, 3, 1. Uh, and the reason that is occurring is because one of these genes, either A or B, is influencing phenotype of the other one. Now, we're going to talk about their experiment with these flowers. And what, the way I'm going to talk about it to explain what's happening is I'm going to tell you what the two genes are doing and hopefully that will help you understand uh, the phenotypes and the genetics. So there's two genes here. Um, it's a nine to seven ratio, so no two genes are involved. Now, what these two genes do is as follows. We're going to call gene one C. And the capital C, of course, is dominant. And this dominant allele is required for any pigment to be made at all. You can't have a pigment unless you have a capital C. If you have two little Cs, the recessive allele, you make no pigment at all. Okay. That's gene one, controls pigment production. The second gene, which we're going to call P for purple, um, is a gene that makes uh, purple pigment. So a capital P is required to make purple pigment. That's a dominant uh, allele. The small P is recessive. And, oh, this is, sorry, this is a typo. This is meant to be two little P's make no purple pigment. I'll tell you what, let's change that. It's not confusing. So little pea plants make no purple pigment, but, and here's the really important point. If you don't have a dominant C allele, you can't make any pigment at all. So it doesn't matter if you have a capital P or not, because you can't make any pigment. Okay. So these guys began with two white true breeding varieties of the sweet pea plant. They were both the same phenotype, white, but they're a different genotype and they're white for different reasons. So this is the parental generation. You've got these two white flowers. The one on the left here, if you notice, is homozygous recessive for the pea allele. So this plant is white, because it doesn't make any purple pigment. The other plant in this cross, which is also white, 
has two functioning purple pigment alleles, but it is homozygous recessive to the CG. So it cannot make any pigment at all. The fact that it um, is homozygous dominant to the P gene doesn't matter because the fact that the, the homozygous recessive C gene is present means that the P gene is immaterial because it can't make any pigment, whether it's purple or not. So this plant is white because it cannot make any pigment at all. So they're white for different reasons. But look what happens when we cross these plants together. So we take these two plants and we cross them together. And of course, they can only make one type of gamete. When you combine those gametes, you get a double heterozygous plant. Now look what's happening here. You have a big C, little C, big P, little P, right? So this plant can make both pigment as one big C, and it can make purple pigment because it has one big P. So this plant is purple because what you've basically done by crossing these two things together is allowed one big P from this plant to rescue the fact that this has two little P's down here. This phenomenon where you have one plant with two big P's and one with two little P's, you cross it together, you get this rescue. This is called complementation. Because a wild type allele or a dominant allele in this plant has complemented to uh, recessive alleles from this plant. And the same thing is happening with the C gene, right? One of these wild type alleles is complementing the fact that this is homozygous recessive to give you this um, big C, little c, purple producing plant. Um, so this is called complementation. These two genes genetically are interacting in that way. Um, and that is why these plants purple. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Two white plants that are white for different reasons, when you combine them together, you get a complementation situation where you get basically single dominant or wild type allele of C and P, allowing this plant to be purple. Uh, the fact that each recessive allele complements the wild type allele, so that's written, that's written wrong, oops. Each wild type allele complements the recessive allele. Is why this is a complementation situation. It tells you the two genes must be involved. Um, because if these, uh, because basically if these plants were white for the same reason, in other words, if you cross two little pea plants together, you wouldn't see a purple plant. There would be no complementation. So let's examine this nine to seven ratio that occurred when they did this, right? So they took these two white plants, cross them together, you get a purple plant, double heterozygote, cross to itself, you get a 16 ratio, because you can do a Punnett square just like the ones you've done before. Now what we have to do, now we know the functions of these genes, we can predict which ones are going to be purple and which ones are going to be white. Because remember, in order to get a purple flower, you need at least one wild type copy, C and P. So if we go through these rows, we see that this top row, uh, all of these guys have at least one capital C, one capital P. This guy does, so that guy's purple. This one does. That guy's purple. Um, any ones that, and, and that is because, right, you need to have a wild type copy of C to make pigment at all. And then you need a wild type copy of um, P to make a purple plant. Anything that does not have both a capital C and a P is going to be white. Because this guy, for example, it's possible for this guy to make pigment, 
but it can't make the pigment because it's homozygous recessive here. It's possible for this guy to make purple pigment, but because of the homozygous C's, it can't make any pigment at all. So when you look at these different phenotypes and genotypes, and how the genotypes predict the phenotypes, you see you get a nine to seven ratio of purple to white. This is actually an example of complementary epistasis, and you know we'll talk about that again in a minute, but um, what you see here is that the alleles of one G can mask the phenotypic effects of the other G. For example, in this situation, right, where you get these two little C's that are masking the fact that you have two big G's. So think back to your classic Mendelian situation where you get this 9331 ratio for phenotypes when you do a dihybrid cross. Here we still have um, a 16 ratio, but the 9331 ratio is basically changed, it's been modified, because now what you're basically doing is 9 look one way, and these 7, 3 plus 3 plus 1 equals 7, all look the same, and they look different from this 9. So you're combining multiple phenotypic classes because they all look the same. But you have to ground yourself in this idea that the ratio is still a ratio of 16, telling you that two genes are involved, and it was essentially a dihybrid cross. Right? Now, we've talked about this a little bit. I just want to nail this point home. Um, genes that interact epistatically by epistasis are usually kind of doing the same thing. So in this case, we had enzyme, we have a biochemical pathway where in order to make this plant purple, it starts off with a colorless precursor. There is an enzyme, remember, enzymes are just proteins, decoded for by genes. So the C gene we just looked at makes this enzyme C. The enzyme C is required to change this colorless precursor into another molecule, which is also colorless, but is an intermediate that can be changed by enzyme P, the second gene, into purple pigment. So that's what I was talking about when I said that gene C is required to make any pigment at all, because you've got to make this colorless intermediate in order to make the purple pigment. If you don't have any of enzyme C, in other words, if you're two little Cs, you can't do this. You can't make this colorless intermediate. And without this colorless intermediate, I'll make purple pigment. So that's why anything that has two little C's is white. If you have two little P's, it doesn't matter if you make this colorless intermediate because you can't convert it into purple pigment. And that's why in this particular case, you need dominant alleles of C and P in order to produce the purple pigment. So when you think about that, right, here is that little biochemical pathway. So now you can see the cross, you can see the Punnett square, you understand what the two genes are doing. And now, if you look at these, you will see that nine of these individuals have C, capital C, capital P, and something else. They're all gonna be purple. Anything that does not contain a capital C or a capital P are all gonna be white. Anything that looks like this is going to be white, can't make purple pigment. Anything that looks like this is going to be white, because it can't make any of this colorless intermediate that needs to be made to make purple pigment. And of course, the double homozygote recessive can't do anything, so they're white. So if you add those phenotypic classes together, you now get the ratio of 16, but the 9 to 7 ratio, right? Um, and that is an example of epistasis, specifically complementary epistasis. I'm going to give you another um, example of um, epistasis. This is a slightly different version. Uh, this is called recessive epistasis. Uh, this is actually um, a, a cross between, again, it's a dihybrid cross, 
Uh, and in this case, we have two genes involved, A and C. Similar to the one we just looked at, the C gene is involved in making pigment at all. These are actually uh, mice. The A gene is interesting because it does two different things. If you have a dominant version of the A gene, then you are a gooty. What does a gooty mean? It actually is a mouse that looks kind of brown because it has some yellow pigment uh, in the hair as well as some black pigment. So it's called a gooty. Um, if you are homozygous recessive for A, then you're actually black because you don't make this yellow pigment. But both of these uh, pigments, both the sort of yellow one and the black one, are dependent upon having at least one of these capital C's. If you think about that, and you look at this, you know, um, 931, such, well, this, uh, this uh, dihybrid cross that we have here. Um, so, you know, classic dihybrid Punnett square. Look at how this works. Nine of these have both a capital A and a capital C. Because they have a dominant C, that means they can make some kind of pigment. And if they have at least one dominant A, they're going to be brown or a gooty. So, of course, we have nine of those, right? This is very similar to that last one we just looked at. Check this out. Anything that has a capital C can make pigment. But in this case, it has two little A's. It's homozygous recessive for this gene, which makes it black. It can make pigment, and it makes black pigment in this case. Anything that has a homozygous recessive C makes no pigment. So it doesn't matter what's going on in A, because it can't make any pigment, it's going to be albino, it's going to be white. And look at this ratio, right? It's still 9331, but these two phenotypic classes look the same. So this gives a ratio of 9 to 3 to 4. Notice that it's another ratio of 16, meaning two genes are involved. It's a dihybrid cross. But there's epistasis here in that one gene, C gene, is affecting the phenotype. So you're going to have to solve some of these problems in the upcoming um, assignment. Uh, how do you solve them? The first thing that you always do is ask if the ratio is a ratio of 60. So if you're given numbers of progeny, you add them all up to get the total, divide that total by 16, which will give you 1 16th, okay? and then divide whatever numbers are in each phenotypic class by 1 16th of the total, and it will tell you if it's a ratio of 16. If it is, what is the ratio? Is it 15 to 1? Is it 9 to 6 to 1? Could be a few different things. If it is, which phenotypic classes would combine to give you that ratio? So if there's a ratio, for example, of um, 15 to 1, it means that this is the only one in the ratio, right? 9, 3, 3, 1. It means this must look one way and the other 15 must all look another way. I'm also going to do a quick video running down how to solve a problem like that, just to give you guys a heads up in solving those problems. Um, so you might be wondering, um, is this an infinite number of possible ratios of 16? And the answer is no. There are only six of them that a Mendelian dihybrid ratio can be modified. And this table shows you all of them. This is actually taken from the supplemental reading on that. So if there's no gene interaction, then you get a 9, 3, 3, 1 ratio, where 9 that are capital A, capital B, look one way, and these are the other phenotypic classes. Uh, these names appear, you don't need to remember. Uh, they just are the names for each one of the different types of um, epistatic ratios. But you see, if you look through all of these, they're all a ratio of 16, and they all combine uh, different types of phenotypic classes. So if we look at the 15 to 1 that I just talked about, this must mean that 
15 of them all look the same. And the only way that can happen is if all of these genotypes look the same, and this one is different. If the epistatic ratio is three to one, that must mean nine of them look the same. And then you add one of these three to that to get you 12, three to one. And then three to one is just three and one. Again, I'm not going to require you to remember these, but I do want you to know to how I do want you to know to solve. And then again, I do want you to know how to solve problems of epistasis and role play. And like I said, I'll go over an example to show you that. All right, the last couple of things talked about in this chapter are just how two different genes can interact. One very common way is one called gene redundancy. And that is um, so right now, and in fact for quite a long time now. We've had tools in lots of different organisms as geneticists to knock out a gene. That means that you can make a homozygous um, knockout of a gene where you completely remove that gene from the gene. So it's a loss of function mutation because you're just literally removing the DNA. Um, interestingly and surprisingly at first, when people were looking at this, when you knock genes out, oftentimes there's no phenotype. And that's because of something called gene redundancy, which essentially means uh, there is another gene in the genome that can do basically the same thing. Um, so when you remove one gene, it doesn't really matter. Why does that happen? Um, sometimes it's literally a second gene that's exactly the same as the first gene. So that's called um, a duplication, a gene duplication. This happens a lot in evolution. You'll get a duplication of part of the genome. Uh, you'll have more copies of one gene then. Um, oftentimes they're not completely identical. One of them will have changed a little bit through evolution. If that's happened, um, those two genes are very closely related and they're called paralogs. Um, and it's often true that if one of the paralogs is missing, the other one can carry out the function. It's gene duplication. It's also gene redundancy. Um, the other common way to see gene redundancy is that there is a second gene somewhere in the genome that is completely different from the first gene, but carries out a common function. And that can actually step in if you knock out um, a gene to rescue a phenotype. Uh, if you look at how that might happen in the genome, right? Um, here are two genes on two different chromosomes, gene A and gene B. Um, these two guys are either um, paralogs or they carry out the same function. So if you remove one, gene B is still around to give you the normal phenotype. The opposite is also true. If you remove gene uh, B, gene A still gives you the correct phenotype. If you knock them out both together, you'll actually get an altered phenotype. Uh, and that'll tell you that the genes are acting redundantly because you knock them both out, you do see it. Um, so that's it for this lecture. Um, that stuff's pretty complicated, so I hope that made it a little bit clearer for you guys. Um, and I hope you're doing okay. All right, bye-bye.